I'll let you take it away. Sure. So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Elder. I work at Rocket Mortgage. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you guys about writing software for a living uh, and some other stuff. We have a fairly small group here, so it's not uh, it's not something that uh, uh, we're going to that I'm going to wait for questions at the end. So we'll just take take those as as we go. So uh, Joe, Joe uh, said earlier that he would run interference for me. Uh, and so if, if you guys have questions to throw them into chat and then Joe will pause me and stop me and we'll we'll do it that uh, way. OK, <clears throat> so today I just want to have a conversation with you guys about what it what it is to write software for a living like what are some of the things that you think that that it may involve um now just a little bit about me um i've been writing software for about 25 years plus professionally so i've been doing it for a fairly long time uh i have been at rocket mortgage for 18 plus years uh, january was my 18th 18th anniversary with the company so i've been at this company for a long time which is kind of unheard of uh, in our industry, uh, a lot of software engineers kind of tend to jump around. Um, and I'll explain more about why I've been there at this same company for such a long time when I get into some of the things about how we write software at, at Rocket Mortgage. Some of my hobbies, as you can see, uh, I'm very uh, versed. Uh, I'm a glamper, so I like my RVing and my camping, my travel trailer with my wife, barbecuing, dogs, crawfish balls. I actually play cornhole. I, I won several cornhole tournaments, so I can throw the bags pretty well. If you're familiar with that game, uh, fishing, boating, hunting, and jeeping, riding trails, just all kind of out, outdoorsy stuff. So uh, while I write software, you can see I have, a, I have a lot of varied interests, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second, okay? So <clears throat> here's where I want to start today with everybody is I want to start with some myth, myth busting. OK, I want to talk about some of the stereotypes that you may hear around software engineering, and I want to talk about some of the mindset that you're going to want to have or focus on if you're going to look into doing this career long term and with great success. Here's the first one that I always run into. When I go up and I introduce somebody to my uh, when I introduce myself to somebody, they're like, hey, what do you do? I'm like, well, I lead a team of software engineers. Um, their first thing out of their mouth is usually this, is that they think that I'm really smart and that I'm really good in math. And those two things couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, and so I just wanna go ahead and, you know, go ahead and get this one out of the way is that when you think of someone that, that writes software, for a long time, we kind of thought that they looked like this. They wore pocket protectors, they had pins, right? Um, and, and those type of things. And that's, that's really not the case. Now, there are some out there somewhere, I'm sure, that, that would that wear pocket protectors and pins. But as you saw in, my, in, in, my, in the About Me section, like, you know, I hunt, I fish, I love boating, uh, barbecuing. And, and so, you know, it's not just somebody that I sit in, a, in an office and stare at a screen all day. The one thing I will say, though, is that <clears throat> when you write software, um, you do need to have some level of smarts. I've never, I've never met someone that was just really, really not, you know, up to par and couldn't form complete sentences as a software engineer. But really what I would say is that it's not as much about the smart factor, although it does help if you can retain information and do things quicker and you're good in math, all that helps, but it's really more about your dedication. And we'll talk about that more. So the, the smart myth, let's go ahead and bust that one out of the way, right? So if you are um, if you were to walk up to the mirror and look at yourself in the mirror and you know what how, how you can absorb information, how well you can regurgitate information, um, can you pay attention to things? Can you read well? We'll talk about that one next. Like those kind of things, you kind of know where you are with the, you know, the other students in your class, right? Um, and so if you're a valedictorian, great, you're going to have an easier path at it, right? But man, let's say maybe you're more of a C or B student, okay? Um, that doesn't mean that writing software is not for you. What I have found over time is that B and C student, they actually are more creative in some cases than the, the ones that, that have more aptitude just on like, you know, certain tests, but they also bring something else to the table, which is common sense. 
And so it's really important to have like this well-rounded individual, I believe is actually the most important part. And it's something I look for whenever I do hiring uh, from the outside. Now, um, the next one I just mentioned it <clears throat> is reading and writing. And whenever I thought about software engineers for a long time, I thought about math, math, math. Now we do do math, but like at Rocket, we do mortgages. And so if you can do, you know, simple math, multiplication, subtraction and division, you can calculate a mortgage. It's not that, not that extremely hard. The, the team I lead today handles all the pricing for all of our loans. And, and Joe's uh, team that, that, that's on the call, he handles adding the fees to it. So we give our clients a really good price. And then Joe's team comes along and charges them a bunch of extra money for it, right? And so, but the actual math of that's not really not that complex, okay? You're dealing with percentages and points and those things. The most important thing, though, is that software engineering, as we'll learn more about it later, is really, uh, you need to be able to read and write really well. Now, when I say read, what I mean is, is to be able to read documentation. We read a ton of documentation. We read emails. So if, if, if you're a speed reader, that's great. If you're, if you're slow at reading, I would suggest to kind of speed it up because we just, we just read so much stuff. Um, if I was to unblur my uh, background, you'll see that these bookshelves are just full of programming and networking and, and different types of books. And so reading is very important, but as well as writing, because you're, you're, A, you're writing a software as a language, but it's not really about that per se, as it is that we are always having to write documentation. We're having to write other things. We're having to write something down to convince others that this is the correct design. And we'll talk a little more about that later as well. So on this particular myth, this one's a fact. You need to be able to read and to write fairly well. I had a team member on one team that I swear at one time, I thought he had read the entire internet because every time somebody would ask something in a, in, in a, you know, in a team meeting about a question, he's like, well, I think I read this thing somewhere. And we, we finally were like, Hey, how, how do you know all of that? And it turns out he had a 36 on reading comprehension on his ACT. And it just really helped him like, you know, be able to just read everything and sort of retain it. I don't have that high of a score. That's okay. So going back to the dedicated, I have to work a little harder than what he does in remembering information. Okay. But it still is a viable soft, it's still a viable career for myself. Another one that you'll run into a lot is introvertedness. Like you have to be an introvert. You got to be this like programming Herman and sit, you know, sit behind a screen and you don't talk or interact with people. And I can't tell you enough that this one is absolutely busted. Um, I wouldn't be here today if I was introverted. Joe wouldn't be here today either if he was uh, introverted. So we are definitely both extroverts and we like to talk and communicate with, with people. But that, as you'll learn later, is super important as to how software gets, gets built, right? It's not that everybody has to be introverted or everybody has to be extroverted. Writing software takes a lot of personalities and a lot of different skills. Not everybody knows every single thing about every single thing, as, as we'll learn as we go. So you don't have to worry about like sitting there and uh, not talking to people. You're not going to be alone as much as what you think you are. You're going to be working with others quite a bit. And so when we think about writing software, a lot of things I get is, man, I just couldn't stare at four walls all day long. It's just, that would be so boring, like just staring at a computer screen. Well, this is kind of how we think about it. Just someone sitting in the, you know, in their desk, and they're staring at the code all day, but you don't, you don't sit there for eight hours and write code. A, it's humanly impossible. Your brain would, would melt uh, because of we, what, what we do as software engineers is so complex. It really takes up a lot of brain energy. Now, my, my nephew is 22 years old and he's living with me for the past, uh, since January 1st. He's living with me because he's 22 years old and he started out doing a computer science major, okay? And he had to work and go to school, then go back and work. Try, he, so he's trying to work and go to school um, at the same time to help pay bills and things like that, obviously. Um, and so I asked him just, I said, well, why don't you just, it's going to take you forever to get out of school by doing the, the work, the kind of starting school, stopping school. So why don't you just come and stay with me uh, for about six months and I will just teach you. We'll do like an internship. I'll just 
have you. And that's his desk right there behind me. He's not here right now, but that's his desk that he sits at every day. And so whenever I'm working, he's basically working. And one of the things that he said after about three or four days was he's so tired. Now, this is a six foot, 250 pound muscle bound football player. Okay. He's extremely, uh, he's extremely active. He's very physical. And he's just like, I'm just so tired. I'm like, why am I so tired? I'm like your brain. You've not worked it out in these 22 years like you are right now, sitting there learning how to program all day. But he's doing like this, these, 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 you know, Pomodoros, as I call them, where they're like 25 minute blocks of time, then he'll take a break, work 25 minutes, take a break. And so we're, we've been kind of training his brain as we go to get a little stronger to be able to work. But that's not what you do. And, and we'll learn why uh, here in a second. So we're going to go ahead and bust the boring myth that your, your, your work is broken up throughout the day. So if, you, if you're thinking that you're going to sit there and write code, you know, constantly, that's really not what's going to happen. The next one I get is, and I used to have this shirt that said, I will not fix your com computer. Cause once my friends found out that I was a, com a software guy, I'm like, Oh, well, you know about computers. That's not necessarily the case. Now I do know a lot about computers. I'm actually, I can tap on my gaming PC that I built during uh, the 2020 during COVID because I hadn't built one in all about 15 years. So I know a lot about hardware. I used to run a hardware company, a multi-million dollar hardware company. So I know a lot about PCs and building hardware and networking and all of that kind of stuff. But it doesn't mean that you have to. Like Joe and I, if we have a trouble with our laptops, we're able to call our help desk. We have gurus that, that love hardware and operating systems, and we can do that. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't know about it. You need to know about the operating system and, and things about it, but it doesn't mean that you just have to be this extreme, like build your own computer type of individual. It doesn't mean that, right? Um, it does mean that you need to, you, you do need to be a generalist and know, you know, know, know enough to how to fix things, because if you can fix it without having to call a help desk, you can get back to work, and that's important. So, you don't have to worry about, you know, working at Best Buy and working in the in the Geek Squad. Now, if you did work at Best Buy and worked in the Geek Squad, you'll be a leg up. You'll actually have a better career path moving forward because you will understand hardware. So it is definitely uh, something you could do. I worked at the IT department in college and I had a blast because I was hanging out with a bunch of like-minded individuals that just lived and breathed computers. And we just had just an immense amount of fun sharing knowledge and sharing things and building computers and understanding things. So this definitely had, that definitely gave me a leg up over others that didn't grow up that, that way, but you don't have to. Okay. Another myth that I hear a lot is, well, you know, if you're going to be a software, you're going to be a hacker, you got to wear long, long trench coats and you got to hate the sun, right? That's kind of the, the old typical hacker stereotype, if you will. This is kind of what we think of. This is the, the hackers movie. I think it was 2016 when this movie came out, I think somewhere in there. And so when we think of like somebody that writes software, we're thinking of this hacker. And that's definitely not the case. I've got I've got tons and tons of contacts throughout the software community. And you know, while they love writing software, they're just like me. They have varied interests. They like to know how things work. Um, they work out, they, some of them don't work out. Some of them do. A lot of us are musicians. I was a, mu a musician in a past life. So if you're, if you're musical, you'll, I, I believe personally, you'll have a leg up as a software engineer because you're used to abstract thought and abstract concepts, um, uh, more so than, than what others have practiced over time. So, you know, you don't have to wear the long trench coats and be a hacker and hate the sun. Uh, to be a software engineer. You can still have a great work-life balance uh, out, outside of work. And it's been, it's been really great for me for these past 25 years. Now, one that you'll also hear about is kind of like, you'll hear, man, technology changes so fast. Like it's always moving and, and, and all of that. And that's absolutely fact. So like, like law, there's always new laws getting written, getting written. So lawyers have to stay up on the law, right? In technology, we have to constantly learn new things. So, you know, X number of years ago, Amazon Web Services, AWS didn't exist. There were no cloud providers. Google Cloud Platform didn't exist. Microsoft Azure didn't exist, right? And so somebody had to go learn that. We wrote software a completely different way. 
The main thing that you want to learn, though, I can tell you guys this just up front is you really, if you're going to get into this career, try not to get distracted because it's literally about 10 to 15 things you need to know. But starting out in your career, the one thing you need to know is pick a language and languages are normally tied to a certain stack. So like if you, uh, Joe and I are experts in the C-sharp programming language written by Microsoft on the .NET platform. And so that's what we we chose to invest our skills in. And so you can go really deep in that language and that in that platform. And I suggest you to do that, like learn that one language and learn it really well, because once you learn it, the next one is a piece of cake. And the third one is really much is so much easier because you'll know the basic fundamentals that you need to know. Right. Once you understand the fundamentals, then you start to kind of pull from different things. Even once you learn about databases and you learn your first one the second one is going to be much easier in a third or fourth and you're going to need to know multiple of these things we don't just write in one programming language we still have to write javascript for example which you know is a language uh, we have to uh, sometimes script some things out so we may reach for something like a python or something like that in the right tool if you're in a data science mike and i were talking about that earlier about machine learning and, and, and ai he mentioned r which is another thing right and a lot of their data scientists use Python today. So there's different languages and stuff that, that you'll do. The main thing is, I want you guys to think about it like this, is just you're gonna be a continuous learner, right? You're just gonna be continuously learning stuff. And so if you don't like learning things, you wanna just learn something and then do that same thing over and over and over, then go be a carpenter. Because once you learn how to do a hammer and a nail and you learn the basics of wood cutting, right? You don't really change it. it hasn't changed over time, right? In this, in this one, you learn these basics fundamentals, and but you get to put these really neat puzzles together and solve these really cool problems. And then in two or three years, there's this new thing that makes that easier and solves it a little faster. And so you get to learn that so you can create more value quicker, faster. And once you can do that, once you can create value quicker and faster, guess what happens? Well, money follows right? Because you're creating more value, you know more things, you're building on top of all of your knowledge base. And the more, the more you know, you guys have seen those things on TV and YouTube, the more you know, the more you make. That's, that's how it all winds up, okay? Those are the facts and myths that I wanted to bust and just sort of talk through. And uh, I haven't heard any questions. So does anybody have any questions before I go to the next section? I'll just pause there. No questions, question. gentlemen. Okay, yeah, here we go. Quick question. Just sure. on that last uh, statement you made about creating value faster, you know, equal money, and where you know the more you make, what would you say is a reasonable, reasonable amount of time for an employee to kind of get established on making money? Or, or is the expectation that, you know, from day one, they're fully independent and okay. actively? All right, so you you're breaking up really bad, but I think what you were asking was what is the timeline or time frame to, to learn and start with? Uh, it's a great question. I'm going to cover that after I get through with these next two sections. I'm going to give you the how many years and the time frame of what you should do and how that progresses as a career. Okay, fair enough. Cool. Okay, I see you nodding, so it's good. Anybody else have anything out there they want to do? Throw it in. Just throw it in chat. Joe can we can uh, he can pay me. I can't see the chat, so. I should probably buy another monitor. <laughs> okay, so I will go on to the, to the next section. Again, you can stop at any, you can stop at any time. And we'll, we will get to that question that you just asked. The next thing I want to talk about really quick is an engineering mindset, okay? And this is super, super important um, because it, it, it's really around how, how can you master this craft? And I call it like a craft. And a lot of us call it the art of software engineering because it really truly is an art form in a lot of cases because you're continually learning. And you can think about when you write code, you're painting on this blank canvas. You're just, you're starting from scratch. And so you're just writing this stuff. And over time, this, you, you have a user interface and you're able to see and you're able to interact and, and build things, right? But this engineering mindset is like really, really important in order to get started. 
And so there's really three different sections of it. First one is around creative thinking. The next one is around logical thinking, logic and reason. Okay, they must, you must be strong in the force with that one. And then the next one is structural thinking. Okay, which you can rename that one to architectural thinking. So think about like the architect or the architecturing of something, right? And so these three pillars form up what I call the engineering mindset. Okay. And so you may not think about writing software as a creative thing, but it really truly is. It's, it's, it's kind of like this. So if you take music, for example, let's say I was a band director in a past life, by the way. So when I say I had a music degree, like I really got a music degree. I also played trombone professionally as, as well. So if I was to go and I told you, okay, here's a symbol. And this symbol means that you give a piece of uh, a musical note one full beat, right? And then I showed you that here's a, another symbol, and that means that you give that note a half of a beat, right? And then I gave you another one that says you give it four beats. And I kept going and going and showed you all of that. And then I showed you scales, okay, and how, how scales were formed, all right? And then I said, okay, now I need you to compose some music. Go. You would probably think I'm absolutely crazy. Okay. But that's literally how we write software. And this has been the thing that my, that my nephew has been struggling with, right, is ever since. Because you remember when you go to school, those classes that like one thing, if you missed the one thing, like you were out for a couple of days because you were sick and you had to come back in, you felt behind because you didn't, you, you missed the thing, right? And so you had to like play catch up constantly with, you know, with the others. And writing software is like that. Like you, we're going to give you like, this is a variable. And this is how variables work. This is a loop. And then this is the next thing. And then this is the next thing. And what you're going to do is we're going to say, okay, now uh, write me a piece of music that sounds like it was done on New Orleans on Bourbon Street in that style. And then you're going to go, because you can't put it all together, right? And this is because you cannot learn how to write software by reading a book. You just can't do it, okay? You can't learn how to paint by reading a book either. Now, you may have some basic, you, you'll gain some basic knowledge and maybe a little bit of comprehension, but what's the one thing you're missing? It's you're missing the one thing that uh, is the hardest to teach anybody, which is called the application part. All right. And so that's applying it. So I can teach you the fundamentals. This is a variable. This is a thing. And this is a thing. Now put it together and solve a problem. And this is that creative thinking. This is why I say that if you're, if you've done music in the past, you have better abstract thought thing, stuff, right? The logical thinking is just how you reason out problems, right? So if I was to say, hey, if it's Wednesday and it rains in Arizona, um, what's the probability of that that's actually going to happen if it rains Wednesday in Arizona, okay? Um, but if it rains in Arizona and on Wednesday, I need you to not turn the sprinkler system on, okay? And that's the problem I want to solve. Now I want you to go solve it with software, right? And so you take all of these fundamentals that you've taken, now you have to put it all together. And that's the logical, creative thinking that may, that's really hard. And until you've done that, like little basic stuff, a lot, a lot, a lot, you don't know the structural thinking. You don't know how to structure it and put it all together. And that's how these three pieces form the engineering mindset, right? And it's something that you do. Back to the question that she asked earlier was, what's the amount of time and those things? I will get to that in a, in a second with these different careers. But this is what takes time because you're, you're working all three of these pillars of your brain. And most of us never hardly touch on these much at a, you know, during a day. I mean, if you're sitting on a Saturday afternoon, sitting on the couch and you're, you're watching Netflix or YouTube, you're not really using these three things, right? And so when you go to work, you're having to use these constantly. And so you're building new muscles, you're building new memory muscles and, and learning new things. Okay. So it's super important. Now, how do these engineering mindsets work? Is this is really important around this engineering mindset. It's around what I call being curious, okay? You have to have this curious mindset uh, for things. And really what it boils down to is this. 
is you need to have this curious mindset to understand how things work. Okay. So it's not just good enough. Is that even properly? It's not good enough to say, uh, okay, X equals five, right? That's a, X is a variable. We're going to assign five to the variable X and you understand that, right? So, okay, I've got it. Let's move on. There's other things happening under the covers there. And those things that are happening under the covers that, that when you start out learning a programming language or learning how to write software, uh, as educators, we're going to skip that because it's just too deep. You don't need to know that right then and there, but you need to go back and get that stuff later. And I call it, it's, the, it's just the fundamentals, right? When you create a variable in any language, it has to go somewhere. The computer has to store it, right? And it stores it in different ways and some are good and some are better. And different languages work with different things differently. But understanding that is that how it works. Let me give an example. So let's say you walk out to the, you're going to go to the grocery store, you're going to go to work in the morning, you walk out to your car, you turn the key, and you hear a click. What's, what's wrong? What do you think is wrong with it? Alternator, starter, battery. One of those things, right? And so ultimately what you have to do with all of that leads into this. You have to solve problems, right? So this, this engineering mindset of creativity, learning and, and, and doing that is ultimately what, what we're given as software engineers are problems. I need you to figure out how to turn the sprinkler off if it rains. Well, I don't know how to do that. Well, how could we solve it? Well, hmm, somewhere out there, there's probably some weather thing that we could probably hit and see if it's raining currently we could just check it every often okay cool now we need to tell that to not you know what's the schedule it's supposed to water we could tell it to stop so we need to do some kind of data interaction with the sprinkler system to do that right so once you kind of got a little map of it you kind of map it in your mind you're like okay i think i know how i'm going to solve this problem and guess what most of the time when you're running software you're always solving a new problem that you've never solved before always in unique and different ways, but that's what keeps it from not being boring. It's just exciting because you get the, you solve the problem. You're like, yes. And you may literally work on it for four months solving the problem. And then you'll walk into a demo and it'll take you 30 seconds to show four months of work. And nobody will appreciate the actual <laughs> time that you put into it, but you solve the, the, the problem, right? And here's the other fun part about this is that writing software, I, I always say this to, to all of our new leaders and our new team members is writing software is a team sport because it truly is. And the reason that it's a team sport is because not one single person now understands the entire scope of the whole thing. Software has gotten so complex with so many moving parts and pieces that nobody understands everything. So we call it failing fast, right? Or failing in public. So if I have a team member on the team and they're like, hey, I don't know how X works. Can you help me with that? And they say it in front of 10 other peers that do some of their reviews and things. Some people may think that's embarrassing. Like they don't know how to do that. How long have they been working here for? But I want them to fail in public. I want them to admit that they don't know it. So then now they can go learn it, right? And so uh, what do they say? The first thing is admitting, is admitting that you have a problem, right? So if you don't under, if you don't know something, go ahead and admit it, fail in public, fail gracefully, and then ask some others because someone on the team usually knows the answer. And so we're, our team is constantly helping each other. We call it pairing. So this is where you're not just sitting in front of the computer by yourself. You're sitting there with a buddy on the team and you're working together because they're so instead of having two by balls on the problem you've got four and sometimes there may be six or eight depending on how complex it is because you may need to borrow a little bit of all of the brain power to literally solve that that problem so pairing is is, is super fun it's also how we build really complex software with these days we do it a lot so team sport and that leads me to the next thing which requires communication okay you have to be a good communicator because we're we're all as a team sport we're constantly communicating whether it's in written form goes going back to reading and and writing or chat like i spend all day in this this office here i'm in south mississippi 
and I've been remote for 15 years at Rocket Mortgage. And so I've gotten really good and I know all the gifts and the memes and all the funny things I can throw in chat to kind of keep, keep, keep things fun, right? Uh, but communication is super vital. It's just so, so important with that, okay? Now to get into the question, is it Pala, Palama? Was that the, your name? I think I'm seeing on the screen. Yeah, okay. Uh, so Paloma. Paloma. Okay. Thank you. Um, how do you, so how do you get into this? So I talked about all the things that you need to understand some of the, some of that kind of stuff. Let's talk, let's talk through some of those career path things and what you need. Okay. So there's a bunch of words on here. I'm going to break them. I'm going to break them down uh, and go through. So the first bullet point is your first job as a software engineer. Okay, that's the associate software engineer. So this is the very first job you get out of college. If you come out of a boot camp, um, you know the owner of the company. He's your former friend's uncle's roommate. You got in the door. That's going to be your first job. Okay, <clears throat> that that job. Have you guys ever heard the expression of someone has to take out the trash? You guys ever heard that expression? Well, that would be you at this point, right? And so what that means in software engineering is that are the things that are simple. So you don't walk into a software engineering career and somebody says, hey, we're gonna build Facebook today and you're gonna help me. That's not how this works, okay? You don't walk in and build a rocket mortgage from scratch, okay? What you do is you walk in just like in a carpenter type, you know, where there's masonry uh, type of stuff. You walk in and I may say, hey, go into this piece of software that's already been written and I need you to add me an extra field into this form, right? Um, I heard about this thing called Twitter. So we're gonna start capturing the Twitter handle of our clients, for example. So I want you to go and add that, right? And that's, that, that's it, that's your task, right? So you can go in and look at what's already there. You kind of see how things are put together, go to that structural thinking, you kind of understand the structure of it and how it's, moving the data from the database to the, to the website and back and saving it. And you kind of understand that. And if I was to give a senior software engineer two more bullet points down that test, they would literally stare at me and go, really? You want, you want me to go out of field right now? I'm like, seriously? Because you're paying me all this money to go out of field, really? Um, and that's because when we get to that, that level, they are usually solving really complex problems. Right, so they are building their really complex pieces and then they kind of pass it down to the software engineers who then kind of go and, and put the plumbing and pull it all together. And then the social engineers are going in and taking out the trash and cleaning up and tidying, tidying and washing the dishes and kind of doing all those you know, cleanup tasks for a while. And I don't want you to sound like, dude, I don't, I don't wanna wash dishes. Like that's not really what it is, but what it, what it is is you're learning how software is built. You're, you're learning, okay? So back to her question was, this is a zero to two year to three year mark. So it's just a couple of years to you to be an associate, okay? You're just, you're learning your craft. If you guys ever heard the 10,000 hour thing, it takes 10,000 hours to master something, which some people say that's total, total malarkey and others say, okay, there's some truth to it. There is some truth to you know, having sustained contact with the subject matter. So if, if you have sustained contact with the subject matter, like software engineering, yes, you can cut some of that time, time down. But there's 2,080 hours in a year. So if you do the math, roughly, that's five, five years to get to 10,000 hours. And that's if you work eight hours a day, 52 weeks out of the year, which none of us are going to do, right? I think I get seven weeks a year off at Rocket now. So yeah, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to put in 2,080 hours. So the, the next one up is that software engineer. So now as a, as a leader of a team, I can give the software engineer the, the problems. Hey, we need to move data from there to there. We need to do it at an X speed of time. We need to be able to hit these kinds of metrics. And so they understand enough of the structure, the creative thinking, and the logic and reasoning mindset that they can put that puzzle together. So I can give them things that they can build from scratch at that point, after several years, three to five years, right? Then that senior software engineer, they're the ones that put that 10,000 hours in essentially, 
if you want like a, a benchmark on that, right? Now, can you close that that gap by working all the weekends and not sleeping? Absolutely, right? You can narrow that window of time down. If you have a very high aptitude of reading comprehension and those things, yes, you can cut that stuff down, right? But on the, on the average, that senior software engineers put their 10,000 hours five years into their career. Sometimes I'll, I mean, I can go, into our system at Rocket and I can find software engineers that have been at the company for nine years, right? So there is no one size fits all time period for anybody. The one thing you need to know here is, under, is underneath the senior software engineer, I have architecture, leadership, or data science. Now where's Mike at? Was Mike and I were talking earlier about machine learning and AI. So Mike, if you're out there from where we were doing the little conversation earlier, this is where you would start looking at AI and machine learning, okay? So once you become a senior software engineer, you're, you're really, at that point, you can choose a lot of different paths, okay? Because by the, by the time you get to a senior software engineer, you've probably done a lot of architectural, that, that structural thinking. You've, you've architected systems or things to work, right? Now, you can go into leadership as a software engineer, but that I, I, I recommend that you have at least three years plus as a software engineer before you ever think about going into leadership as a technology leader. Okay, now that, that doesn't mean you can't go do something else in part of the business as a leader, but as a technologist, uh, as, as you're, you're going to be leading an engineering team, you need to know how to do what they're doing, right? Because you're going to have to write reviews, you're going to have to measure your team members, you're going to have to mentor them. So if you don't know how to do it, it becomes really, really hard and really challenging. Okay, so you want to bake for a while, several years in there before you think about jumping on the leadership wagon. Okay, now you got the senior software engineer, you baked there for a while, you're really kicking, uh, you're really kicking some butt, you built some amazing things, you've got a lot of things that that were built that are still standing and, and people have, you know, can respect that you can now choose the architect path and go into that more structural thinking about software, just kind of full-time structural thinking and helping others grasp how to put the puzzle together. Or you can go to the leadership track or this data science track, right? This is where you get more into the machine learning and artificial intelligence where you're, you're training models. And into that path, as I told Mike earlier, that's where you're going to really run into like linear algebra and very high high level maths, right? So if you want to go down that data science path, you need to be really good at math or at least love math and put a lot of work in, one of the two. So either be dedicated at it and just, and just love it or be demonstrably talented uh, in, in math, linear algebra equations and all of that type of stuff. The next one up is a staff software engineer. This is someone who you can basically just throw any complex problem at it. They know multiple languages, multiple stacks. They kind of They've, they've built it all. These are software engineers like at, at, at Rocket. We probably have 10 out of 1,800 team members that have that title. In principle, we only have two or three, maybe four that have principle. So the principle is like they've, they you can't replace them. Like they're just amaze balls, right? These are team members that have built something just so truly amazing, so high level. Um, that they just have such a high level of skill uh, a, as it is, right? So they're your P Picassos of, in the painting world, right? And we actually have some other roles above that. Now, so we kind of went really slow on that one. I'll, I'll kind of speed up from here because we're talking about software. But once you then jump to architecture, so you need to be a senior software engineer prior, then you can jump to the architecture role. Now you've got this other track, right? So you can go to senior architect, solutions architect, enterprise architect, and there's, you know, senior solutions architect, senior, like there's different levels. And so again, as you add value, right? You, as time, every time you change a role, then you're going to get usually a compensation adjustment, right? You're going to put you into a different bucket. So you start out, you're down here on this bucket, and then you go to software. Now you're in a bigger compensation bucket. Then you go to a bigger bucket. You go to a bigger bucket. You keep working your way up because you're creating value, right? That's how we do things in, in this country is I can do something. Somebody pays me for it. I give up my time. I can do this thing, and then they compensate me for it, right? So the more value you create, the more things you know, then money follows with that. Okay. The other one is a leadership. So I said, you know, right, 
write software for three years as a team leader and before becoming a team leader, you want to understand how to do that role. I call it sitting in the chair. So it's hard for a leader that hasn't sat in the chair, you know, with it. So you need to understand all of the agile principles, how software is written, the software developer life cycle, how all that's put together. How do you build quality software? How do you test it? That's all the stuff you're going to get in those three plus years, right? Then you can go into a team leader where you'll lead an engineering team. Uh, I'm a senior team leader today. I was to go one down where you lead multiple software delivery teams. That's what Joe's doing today. I, I was a director for 12 years. I, when you get to that level, you kinda, you're kind of phasing out the technology for the most part, right? Because you're not writing software anymore. You're not leading teams directly that are writing software like, like what I am. So I wanted to go back closer to what I call the, the metal. I wanted to get closer to where the software was actually written. And so I wanted to go kind of call it a demotion, but it's really just, I wanted to do something different. So, uh, and then you've got v, VP and CTO and then CIO. And those are all roles that, you know, as you go up, it's like trying to get into the NFL. There are, there are less of those, right? So there's, there's less roles for CIO in this country than there are just, uh, team leader positions or software engineering positions. Okay. But those, those CTO, VP of engineering, CIO roles, those are still technical roles. Usually the CIO has been an architect. They've been a software, a senior software engineer for a long time. They've been an architect. They can usually communicate very, very well. And at a high level, they're able to uh, motivate, motivate team members make them make them want to feel motivated they're they absorb the culture they're just they're leading the whole technology stuff right so it takes a very unique set of skills as you go up uh in there right so you definitely can't wear black trench coats and uh be uh a hacker if you're going to be a cio that's that's not the type of role it's more of a a, a c level role right okay all right so any questions around any of the career paths i just I just laid out for you. Well, I have a question like, how did you choose your career path that you are today? It chose me. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, how did I choose my career path? I, I, I'll, I'll be completely honest. I just love computers. I didn't have a path. I just love computers. And if people paid me to work on them, that was even better. Honestly, I just, I love technology. I've always said if it plugs into a wall or takes a battery, I want to own it or play with it. You know, kind of, kind of one of those things. Um, my career path was, um, I, I was, um, I was in a leadership of a hardware company for a long time, but then started writing software. So I, I was already kind of at this C C level within a company, but I just wanted to keep playing with software. So I kept writing software at night and on the weekends and I would come out, I'd come back to work in the next morning and I would add new features to our shopping cart. And I just kept doing, it. I just, I just, again, I just loved that. Right. Um, but when I went to rocket, I was a software engineer, then a senior, then a leader, then a director. I stayed the director for a while, did something else there internally. And then went, I wanted to get closer to writing software with the business. So my career was started as a software. So if we go back a couple of slides, right? I started like, well, I kind of skipped the associate because I had just dabbled and played for so long for so much. I just sort of skipped past that one, right? But I started as a software engineer because I had a lot of experience when I came in, uh, in and then was a senior uh, software engineer. Then I went to leadership, leading a team. And then I went to the director. And then I went and did something else for a little while. And I wanted to go go back down and lead a team where they're writing an actual product, building, building something. So that's kind of my career path. I actually have a, there's a podcast out there that I gave like my whole, how I got started in IT stories about 45 minutes. If you really, really want to know my background, I can share that. Uh, just, just email me. My, my email's at the bottom. I'll, I'll happily look that up for you and share. If you want to hear like the, the whole story of how I really got into it. Uh, with it. There's a little bit of hacking involved is how I got into the tech technology uh, thing. So, yeah. Any other questions out there? I have a question. Sure. What's it like to work with software while you're in these career paths? 
What's it like to work with software? Yes. Okay, now explain what you mean by working with software. What do you mean by that? Like in these, I see that there are different career paths when you work with software. I want to know what it is like. I'm trying to figure out how to answer your question. So you work with software. So you mean like writing the software, like what that's like? Is that what you're going for? Or yes. Okay. Um, so let's just take a typical day real quick, right? Let's say it doesn't matter if you're an associate, a software, a senior engineer. Let's just take a typical day, right? So in across the country, in all the companies that hire software engineers, most all companies today have something that's called a stand-up, okay? And a, and a stand-up is called a stand-up because if people sit down, the meeting can last a long time, right? So we call it a stand-up. So everybody shows up. They literally just everybody's around the cubicle and they kind of go over to this area and they, they, they say three things. What did they do yesterday? Do they have any roadblocks and what are they going to do today? Right. And so it takes about 15 minutes for the team to kind of do that as to what do they do and what are they going to do today? So that helps the project owners and project managers know, you know, are, are, are things progressing accordingly? Right. Um, if something's behind, somebody can get some help. And if like as a leader, as myself or Joe as a leader, that's, that's on the call, if somebody has a roadblock, that's where we jump in and we go to action. So we're going to go in like a big bulldozer and pl plow the road for you. So that way you can focus and get things done. Right. So that's the first meeting of the morning. You're going to come in, you're going to check your email. You're going to look at chat. There's probably going to be some, some cat videos shared in chat with the team. You're going to have fun, right? It's not, it's not all all just serious business. Then you're going to go to stand up from, from there. You'll know exactly what you're supposed to work on. And then you're going to break out and you'll go work for an hour or so. You'll take lunch. Uh, you'll come back. You may have another meeting. You'll kind of break your day up. And then you, you kind of work, you kind of work through, you'll have some pairing sessions with the other team members. If you need help, you reach out, right? If you don't know something or you're like, ah, I've, I've never done that. How can I get help? That's where like you would reach out to me as your leader and I would either just show you and coach you, right? Or I would say, hey, here's some really good videos of how to do this. Um, and this is how, you know, you can progress. That's a typical day. Um, today at work, you know what we did? We came in, we had a stand up and this is, I'll talk about this later in the next section, but this week at Rocket Mortgage is hack week. So we get to spend the entire week hacking on whatever we want. Now, how cool is that, right? And you may think like, why would a company do that? Well, it's to, it's to allow innovation, like to, to bring in new ideas, you know, and things. So this morning, our team, we had a stand up and then they just all went and they started working on these little pet, pet projects. They were just hacking away. One of the team members on the team, she's an associate engineer. You know what she did is her Hack Week project. She, she took time to learn the solid principles in software engineering. So she's making her, she's trying to create more value and increase her craft, right? Which therefore creates more value for her, makes her more valuable as a team member. She needs to fill in some learning. So she, she took it as a time to, to do some self-learning and self-study. So that's what we did today. We got to go hack on stuff. Actually, I hacked on a PowerPoint presentation, as you can see. That's what I did today, mostly. Um, but, you know, it's kind of, it's no day is the same. I mean, you're going to write software. You're going to be given a problem. We have these little cards, they're called stories. It's all electronic on these electronic boards. You'll, you'll get assigned a task um, and it'll say something like, I need you to, if it's raining, I need you to turn the automatic sprinklers off, right? That'll be your story. And so you're gonna stare at it if it's your first week on the job and you're gonna have no idea how to do it. And so you're gonna have to reach out and get help, right? And so as part of like our team, like everybody helps each other. Like it's, you're not just thrown to the wolves, as they say, you, you have help, you can reach out, you can, you can get things. There's, you know, you got YouTube and videos and books and resources and all of those things, all those things as, uh, as well. So it's, it's not as scary as it was back whenever I started, because we didn't even have the internet, sort of, it was very expensive to get a hold of, but we had to go to the library and read a book. You know, if you happen to bump into somebody in the library, you didn't let them go. They were like your new best friends. So you could kind of get together and meet up. And that's how we had started having com computer meetups and stuff. And that's literally how we shared information was getting together once a month and just sitting around talking and 
that, well, I figured this out. Well, I did this. Cool. Show me how you did it. Those kind of things. So, well, yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. I don't know if I hit it on the mark, but go from there. Anybody else have a question before I go on? I do. This is Jackie Partridge in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And it kind of um, bleeds over from your last comment is what are some ways that you find to build, you know, the teamwork camaraderie? It sounds like um, there's not necessarily individual wins. It's a team win. And that sounds like you're creating a team environment with these stand-ups and uh, synergy between learning. Um, what are some ways, I, I, I worked for American Express for 18 years and I dreaded team building activities because we were, we were uh, rated individually. And so it was a very competitive and then professional environment, but then they wanted us to do team building and go, you know, learn some Sawadee, mm -hmm. you know, martial art dance or something uh, odd like that. Um, so I'm interested in how Rocket Mortgage has created that environment and what you do for team building. Sure. Well, I'm going to cover a lot of that in the next section about how we handle, how we write software at, at Rocket Mortgage. So I'm going to cover that. So I won't, I won't touch on it too, too long, Jack. It was a great question. Um, so we're, we're all about the team itself. Um, one of the things we, we do for fun is we get together every couple of weeks on a Friday. We just, if they want to, somebody wants to bring a beer or a favorite beverage. They, they, they can. Right. Um, and we'll just, we won't, we won't go dancing because most people are remote on our team. So we'll, um, we'll play draw of swords or some other, uh, own online games. Um, there's also like escape rooms that, that like you can buy that are virtual, which are really super fun. Instead of like going into the escape room, we'll kind of do that. Um, but it's just, it's a very much just a team thing. Like we get to know each other really well. We spend a lot of time with each other. Um, and I talked about the stand up with uh, Leah, but like the stand up is, yeah, we cover those three things of what you do yesterday, what do you, you know, any roadblocks and what are you going to do today? If I said those correctly, I can't remember. But we also talk about who's buying a house, who's going to upgrade their house, what's happening. Um, we don't talk about religion and politics and things that would get anybody in trouble, right? So we talk about other fun things. Hey, I'm going to build a computer, I'm putting in a pool you know, those kind of things in, in life as it happened. And we may go an extra 15, 20 minutes just sitting there, just, just getting to know each other better uh, with that. Leaders have one-on-ones with all of the, all of the team members uh, by bi-weekly. So you'll, you'll have a dedicated time to talk to your leader. We use that time just to get to know each other better. I get to know you, you get to know me. Um, and um, I can, I can rate you based on your performance, based on, when I look at your code, right? I don't, I don't need to go and you have a survey, but I can look at your code and go, yeah, she's, I know how long it would take me to have done that and write that code. And so I can pretty much judge how you're doing and how you're trending um, by how fast you're able to solve those problems. And starting out, it's going to seem like you can't get anything done, right? But over time, as you'll start asking help, should be you'll stop asking for help over time and start just a little more doing a little more doing a little more doing and every time you do what's called a pull request which we use get github for you know everybody on, on the team gets can can see what you're doing uh with that so that's that's how we can you know do your do your ratings and know if you're trending in the right uh direction but we're all about growth we're all about helping each other uh, with it. And all of that boils down to Jackie is our culture, which I'm about to talk about our culture here in, here in just a second. You'll, you'll kind of see some, some kind of fun things that we do. I got a lot of good pictures for you. So hopefully I'll answer some more of those Thank questions. You. Thank you for sharing. I hope when I get done, you'll be like Rocket Mortgage kicks, but they're better than American <laughs> Express. That's what I want to hear. So what, but we'll see. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> all right. So Anybody got any other questions before I get into how we just kind of a great segue. I'll send you some PayPal money, Jackie, uh, later. So a great segue <laughs> into this section is writing software at Rocket. Like, how do we do that? And does anybody have anything before I jump into this section? Okay. Yeah, just real quick. Sure. Um, I hope I hope my audio improved. Um, yeah, so it, it did. You, okay, you mentioned your nephew and kind of building up that mental endurance that he does behind you. At his desk. So what's yeah. the goal? You know, are, are you going to get him or, or the average new engineer to do two, three straight hours? Or what's, what, what's the measure? I, I have him, I have him working on challenges and, and tasks. So 
he gets assigned, he gets assignments. I have, I have one written down on the white whiteboard up here. Sometimes I'll use to, to do is to just assign him puzzles and challenges of coding. So he, he typically puts it an eight hour day, uh, takes a, takes a lunch break and stuff, but he can take breaks whenever he wants. He can, um, he can, you know, if he wants to pick his laptop up and go in the living room or go on the back deck and just think in a different spot, it's totally, it's totally up to him. Um, what I'm just trying to get him to, to do is just work on his fundamentals. That's literally all I'm focusing, focusing on. The end, the end game for him is to get him an internship. Once, once I've taught him enough of the fundamentals over the next probably, will probably be in the summertime before I give him. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take four years of college and condense it down but doing it at a different rate that not only am I condensing the college, but I'm giving him like, these are the tools we're using in the enterprise. This is how it works. This is like, you can imagine the amount of experience that I have that I can, that I can give him. So he's getting like two or two or three degrees here for basically for free. Right. So um, I told him I'm going to take 10% of all future earnings for the rest of his life. We already, I'm, I'm working on the contract now for that, but so um, my, my goal is to get him an internship and then uh, hopefully get him into that associate software engineering role somewhere, not necessarily at Rocket, but somewhere so he can start his career and um, just getting, getting him in there, help, helping him lay that foundation. He does want to finish his degree, so I'm really proud he wants to do that. And, you know, like at Rocket, if you want to go get a degree once you get into the company and you're full time, we will pay you to go finish your degree. Right. So a lot of companies offer that as a perk. So that's the end goal. That's the end game. Yep. Before you move on, Keith, Michael asked the question, what's the most difficult part about writing software? Typing. Is that the wrong answer? Is that not good? Typing. Yeah. <laughs> it's with me. I can't tell you how many times I misspell stuff. Yeah. It's, it's a joke, but it's literally true. Typing. Like that's the hardest part of programming is typing is knowing what to type. And once you figure that part out, the rest of it kind of falls, falls into to place. I mean, I can't tell you how many times you'll, if you, if you know how to solve the problem and you understand all the structural stuff and everything that's it's there. The thing that takes you the longest though, Michael is the fundamentals. They don't come easy. This is not a, this is not a quick game, right? This is not get a job in three months. You're an expert six months, you know, you're, this is a long-term play, but the amount of value that you can create and the amount of wealth you can build in this career path is tremendous. The potential is really tremendous. And if you build something, if you happen to create something that, you know, others want to use and buy, like it's, it's an unlimited potential, you know, look at, look at, you know, Steve jobs and the, what he created, look at Zuckerberg. Like those are, those are, not the norms, obviously, but there's a lot of people that have created things that have sold things, right? So, um, but if you're just going to go work for someone and write software, which is fine, it's it's a great way to uh, live life, have a great work work life balance, uh, and be be compensated for it. Right? Because in in here's why is what I keep telling my nephew over and over and over is if it was easy, everybody would do it. Right. He's he's had days where he literally wanted to take the keyboard and like hook smash, like you know, like kill the keyboard and and step on the mouse and those kind of things. It can get frustrating. But that's 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 one of the things is it's going to be really frustrating at first because nothing is going to work and it's going to be a lot of reading for a little bit of re reward, you know. Um, you can literally work for four or six hours just to print one number on a screen just to get it to work. And not everybody has the wherewithal to, to go through that. I think it's fun. Like I'm solving a problem. I'm making a computer do something, right? That's why computers exist. Com computers exist for us to automate tasks. Banging on my, on my gaming PC, right? They, are, they were built to, to do repetitive tasks and to do them really quickly and really fastly, right? And so that's why I was always interested in the com computer side. It just so happens I get paid for it now, which is amazing, right? But, you know, I started out trying to make it do other things like calculate something for homework or, you know, those kind of stuff. And it just sort of snowballs. But the, the truth of it is, is that it's, it's going to get frustrating. You're not going to know how to solve it. Just keep 
this is a great thing, by the way, because you guys have a have a network. You have people that you can reach out to. You can bounce ideas off of. Having that little network is just so important when you're starting out in your career. Because again, no one person writes everything from front to back in any piece of software. Now everybody works on their pieces. I one thing I didn't say in the in the career piece is this: is that after you've baked. You've done your baking for a while. You've kind of got to that senior software role uh, or, or even software role. You can, you'll start to specialize. You will like certain things or, and be better demonstrably talented at it than you will other things, right? And so that's where you can start to gravitate into what you want to specialize in, right? It's just like doctors. If a doctor, doctors just don't go to school and become a brain surgeon. They have to go through all these years, right, of general. They have to know the whole human body. They got to know how everything works, how it puts together. They got to know all the systems and the subsystems. Software is the same way. And then once you sort of you understand you're a generalist, which is really what you want to try to strive for, is have a general knowledge about everything, then you can start to specialize and do the brain surgeon, or you may want to specialize in hands or tendons and you know, legs and certain certain parts of the anatomy, the eyeballs, things, things like that, ear canals and stuff. So there, you can specialize in those areas, but you got to understand all the found fundamentals, the foundation stuff. First. Okay, fantastic question. All right, let's learn how to write software at Rocket. What do you guys think? What's it like there? Well, let's start with a, so well, let's start with some numbers, the Rocket by the number. So um, our technology team is roughly 1,800, plus uh, team members these days. And we, we reference it as a family. And so you'll, you'll hear uh, if you, you know, Rocket is RKT uh, on the, in, the, in the stocks, the, the stock market. Um, and you'll hear this rock, you'll, you'll hear this rocket companies. When, whenever we talk about it, it's the rocket family of companies because we think of it as a family of just, you know, different, uh, different sections that we can all tie tie threads with and stuff. Um, and so, like, here's an example of us coming to, together. Uh, this this is an event that was happening uh, every month or or every so where we would just pull pull everybody in technology together and uh, and have a good old um, what we call talk IT at the time uh, group. And this is in this is in one of our offices in downtown uh, Detroit. You'll see a lot of our buildings and a lot of our uh, offices through throughout this slide um and so you know like a couple of times a, a year we would host these larger events yes there's somebody dressed up as yoda uh there that's one of our one of our uh vps of engineering uh was was she, she was hosting the uh, hosting the event so they they pull us you know all several thousand of us into the fox theater and they put a big show on and and stuff like that. So really, really super, super fun event. So Jackie, you talk about how do we do team bonding and what do we do? These are some examples of, of kind of how we how we do that uh, and stuff. And um, and the, the really the, the main thing that drives all of this is that at Rocket, we have something called the isms. And it's, it's kind of unique because we don't have a mission statement, you know, and uh, if you think about like a mission statement, a mission statement is something that somebody somewhere wrote that nobody reads typically, right? Um, and it, but it doesn't also tell you how to act and, and, and how to do things either, right? And so the actual isms, there's 19 or 20 of these. I, I lost count uh, recently because I think they added another one. But these are like little sayings. So we have all these cartoon characters and they're all throughout the building in the office, right? And so like one of these that, that you may hear is every client, every time, no exceptions, no excuses. Now, what does that mean if you're at Rocket Mortgage? It means when you're writing software that you cannot drop a single message from one application to another because every client every time, no exceptions, no excuses. We're very client focused. This is why we've won so many JD Power Awards. We talked about American Express earlier. I have an American Express card, I happen to love American Express and they are the JD Power winner of credit cards. And so Rocket is the JD Power winner of mortgage companies because we're very client focused. Some others on here, you'll hear uh, some words that I've already said earlier. They're just innate, they're just 
they're just eight, 18 years of, of me knowing these is money follows. It doesn't lead. And what does that mean? I just told you guys, right? You build value, you do things, the company will re re reward you for you creating that, that, that value. Focus on the creating of the value and the money will follow, right? Don't lead with the money. Never, it never works out, okay? Um, so these are just short, catchy phrases, and these things drive our culture. You, as we go through the slides, you'll, you'll see some of these, and I may, I may call them out, okay? So one of the things that we definitely are is just anti-corporate. Like, it's a very fun culture. So uh, this picture was taken a, a couple of years ago. Uh, the lady on the left, um, right above the dash, that's Ling Long He. She was our CIO at the time. Uh, and there's Dan Wallachy across from her and then Brandon. And uh, uh, these, are, these are all like some of our, our top leaders. And they're having races down the hallways, which is pretty fun. We kind of like, we kind of do it like a horse race. We're going to bet on who's going to win around the corner and stuff, which is kind of kind of fun. Probably somebody, somebody's probably written an app now to, to, to handle all that. But you'll see, our, you'll see our offices here are very vibrant, very colorful right? They're, they are really, really awesome. It keeps that, it keeps that energy and that, that stuff up. So you think of like a, I'm getting a mortgage, it's all black and white, just gray and, you know, stuffy, cuffy kind of bank stuff. And that's really not who we are. And we wouldn't be there. We wouldn't be where we are today if that was, that was the case. And I wouldn't have stayed working there for 18 years. I can promise you if that was the case. All right. So it says, hello, my name is they. So that's the, uh, the catchphrase there is we are the they, right? And if you ever heard somebody say, well, they do something, they did this. Well, we're all together. You can't, that's not good, right? You can't just pass blame. You gotta, you gotta go help solve the problem, get together, bring, bring people together and work as a team, right? So super important. Uh, open door policy. This is Bill Emerson uh, taking a picture with somebody. Bill was our previous CEO. Um, he has since moved on. Jay Farner is now our CEO, but just a you know a really big open door policy there. Again, anti anti uh, corporate. You know, if you've got a question, you can just go talk to the CIO, the CTO. Doesn't matter me, anybody uh, around. So it's really just kind of an open door policy with stuff. You know, and team members are really empowered to like find solutions. And like, here's the thing at, at Rocket. So it it doesn't matter. Like Leah asked earlier, it doesn't matter if it's day one for you or day 10 years. If you have an idea, you can speak up, you can say something, we can do it better, we can incorporate it, right? So if you're, if you're there on day one or 10 years, it doesn't really matter. You are empowered to make things better and to help us solve problems. That's ultimately what we're doing is we're trying to automate the mortgage industry, among other things, and build a really amazing platform that, that, that helps us power that. So you look at the little icon up here. It's really about the inches. That's what we call it. It's all about the inches. You know, football is a game of inches. And so is software engineering. And so is life at Rocket Mortgage. Now we do work hard, right? It's not all fun and games and, and, and parties, Jack. Okay, so we do work hard. This is one of our business intelligence areas. Um, and so you can see the desk have papers on them. They're kind of strode around. They've got four different screens. So we're, we, we work really hard at it, right? Um, and so we do work hard, but we also play hard too, right? Uh, one example of us working really hard was when we actually built Rocket Mortgage. You know, we were, we were known as Quicken Loans at, uh, there for a long time. But when we built Rocket Mortgage, it took 500 plus team members. We, they, they worked on Rocket Mortgage for three plus years. And we, 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 literally, took, we literally took our technology team, split it in half and said, okay, this group's going to go work on the new thing. And this group, you keep the lights on and keep everything working over here, right? And that's what we did. And so we, we, we went to go build this whole new thing that we call Rocket Mortgage today. Um, it's basically to just automate, automate that. Um, and the end result of that three years of work is absolutely, uh, it's, it's, was earth shattering because uh, we transformed the industry overnight. We actually launched a Super Bowl commercial in February 2016. And we've been working on this thing for years. It was just as secretive as like the iPhone before it got, re, you know, introduced to the world. It was, nobody was talking about it. And then we just dropped this, this crazy Super Bowl ad uh, in 2016 at the Super Bowl and told the whole world about it. And pretty, pr pretty cool to just transform an in, in, in industry overnight that was thought up to be this long drawn out paper process. 
and to automate and digitize the whole thing. So really, really proud of that work. Joe and I, we worked our tails off during that time. I can tell you, uh, it was it was nuts. But once we got done, we launched it. You can see the date here, February 23rd, 2016. We had an IT gathering. We pulled everybody together and we had a really amazing party and, and celeb celebration of that whole, whole process. But we're not done there you know, playing hard. So we, we peeled off about 300 team members that were really successful in making this thing work. And we sent them to a four day, all Cancun expense paid trip to go to Can Cancun. These are reduced. They're just the technology team members that they got to go. So, and this boils down to one of our isms that execution is worship. Innovation is rewarded, but execution is worship. Right, so it's, it's, it's really great to innovate and to say, hey, I have an idea, but if you can't build it, then what's the point, right? And so we, we you know, those that executed at a, at a really high, high level, we got to reward our team members for that. And, you know, you kind of think of this larger company like we are, we're close to, I don't know, 29,000, 30,000 team members total. You know, unlike a lot of companies, uh, Leadership is just not the only opportunity for, for growth. A lot of people think, well, I've grown as a software engineer. The only thing I can do is go to leadership. And that's not necessarily the case. This, this picture here was taken at our data center in Detroit. We actually have two data centers. And this was a state-of-the-art data center when we built it. Uh, we spent over $75 million building this. And so when we're, you know, whenever we first started as a company, nobody knew that we needed a data center engineer, you know, but the network engineers got together and said, we need a data center. Like, we need to do this. And so they literally just created their own roles and went out and built a data center and won a bunch of awards and stuff whenever they built it. It's truly, truly an engineering marvel um, at it. Um, I mentioned Hack Week earlier, right? So we're, this is Hack Week for us. It's truly really amazing. We get to spend a whole week just hacking on things. Here are some of our top engineers. Uh, some of our brightest engineers are working on a really cool uh, project during the during the uh, hack it hack it week. These these gentlemen are actually uh, working on at the time they were working on creating an Amazon Echo or Alexa skill. So you can just look over to Alexa and say, "What's the balance of my mortgage?" All right, just something kind of cool. It's something that nobody would ever say. Hey, we need to do this. We need to build that. So they're they're innovating. They're learning new technologies. Again, can continuous learning right plays plays into that right. Uh, and speaking of learning, there's this guy here. I have I found this picture. This guy Joe 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 G here learning at a, one of our events. So we have our own. Uh, we call it Tech University in, internally. It's our internal training team. They're an award-winning uh, internal training team, and they put on all kinds of classes. It could be from like soft skills like emotional intelligence or communication. It could be technical skills like object-oriented programming or source control with Git. Um, but they're they're, they're, out, they're aimed at helping anyone uh, in any role learn and grow in, in, in technology, even if they're not in technology, like even our bankers can take these classes, right? And vice versa, we have tons of mortgage classes that they put together. And so tech, technologists can, can take and learn stuff about the business. And as, and, uh, and as technologists learn things more about the business, they start to see these like threads and they'll start to tie things together and they'll see the problem, right? And then they'll want to go solve it. And that's that's why we love our technologists learning about the business. So we have a really, really great in, in internal train, training thing. But not only that, but all of our team members can go to conferences. We want them learning. We want them to, you know, bring in new ideas and, and do that uh, during the year as well. But in some cases, you have team members that have families and they, they can't travel. They may have young, young kids. And so we bring the conference to them. So this is literally us hosting our own internal technology conference. We call it TechCon. We have it every year. And this is one of the Blue Angels giving us a presentation, probably one of the best keynotes that I've ever, I've ever watched. So you can see the screen. We're over in the, uh, we're, we're over in the convention center in downtown D Detroit. And I would call its name, but it got renamed. I don't want to mess it up. But I think it's the TCB now. TCB, it is TCB. Thanks, Joe. So this is a, like a major, major, huge screen. So we pull in all of our technology team members from all the Rocket companies. It's not just Rocket Mortgage, but all of Rocket. Like everybody's getting to learn. Everybody's getting leveled up at the same at the same time. Um, and and so this is one of those 
Uh, really cool things that we do is it's a couple day event that we host it. We bring in external speakers to, to speak, give our team members new ideas, teach them new things, learn new things, and then they can go back and do stuff. We also give back to the community. So here's an example of us doing some stuff with a QSTEM program. Uh, we, we do stuff to help girls out in Detroit to give them a better understanding of, of technology. Uh, we actually have volunteer hours that, that we get. So we get our regular PTO time off. Um, we get ber bereavement time. If you have a, you know, a mother, father, child, something like that pass, unfortunately, you get 20 days of bereavement for that, but you also get volunteer hours. You get three days, personal, uh, growing days. So you can take three days a year to just take off and go learn something, which is fabulous, right? So we, we want to, we're, we want all of our team members to, to stay in technology, to learn tech technology. And so we give them that, that extra time to, to go and learn. Uh, with it right so you know, if i had to wrap it up and say like who who are we um you know we're we're 1800 passionate technology team members that really focus and care about our clients and we're focused on building the next big thing to revolutionize the fintech industry and what do we do you know we're just really a, we're amazing at helping our clients with their life's largest purchase right because the home is the most expensive thing that you'll buy unless you're a super billionaire and buying a hundred million dollar yacht or something like that which we can't help you with but we we try to help our clients with their largest purchase and make that super simple and as amazing as we can for them and what makes this really special is that why i've been there for 18 years is that the isms really provide this foundation for us having a fun and it's an innovative culture as as you can see hopefully from some of the pictures it's not just this crazy dark gray bank vault that we all go work in, right? To hand out money for people's houses. And that's what it's like to write software for a living and at Rocket. Okay. Uh, I got a little, I see you've got a golf tap from Jackie there. Thank you, Jackie. <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> Any questions? Anybody have anything out there that needs to wrap up? You also see I can't count 47 or 46. Who did the math on that? Questions? That's why we said math there? is optional. Yeah, it's optional for us. Uh, I have a question. Keith, thanks for your presentation. I really like it. Uh, I was wondering how is like uh, how is the team that you manager that you uh, lead in? Mm -hmm today like how many people uh, how do sure. you guys like so uh, I, I recently had 10 team members on the team writing a, a piece of software but uh, we transferred we transferred one so I have nine currently on the team nine is eight eight to nine is a really great size um, you get a get a lot of variety you have different different team members can special and do different things kind of you know as you start to grow uh, so we have a team of nine. We're part of a larger group that all of us handle stuff with pricing our uh, loans. And so there's about 28 of us total that work with just pricing as it relates to a loan. Can you think about, you may think, well, just give them a price. Well, it's very complex because it's based on bonds and markets and, and, and things. And then you have all this other stuff that where marketing wants to handle promotional type of things and, and stuff we have, we're bound by government regulations. And so there's a lot of rules that we have to bake into our, our pricing system. So, um, but so the, the, our team builds one product, we build a, it's basically a, we build a system that handles and calculates pricing for our clients who work in capital markets. So capital markets is they're like the, they're the, propeller heads of, of finance, right? They are the, they are the Steve jobs of handling bonds and marketing uh, markets and, and indexes and those things, right? So these, these guys have to be able, and, and girls have to be able to project out, you know, in three months, what's the rate going to be? What is somebody going to pay us for that loan? So that's, it's a, it's, it's super important uh, for our, for our business. Um, and, uh, but the, our, the, the team, I don't say my team, cause I don't, they're not, I don't own them. I just call it our, you know, it's, it's our team. 
our team builds that pricing product. Um, and eventually all, all 20 or six or 30 or however large the team will get, will all build pieces of that one product. So we're in the process of standing it up, uh, currently and getting it off the ground. And then others are going to come in and build their pieces on top of it. So hopefully, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Now I, I just have another question. Like uh, mm -hmm. your uh, the team like is just developers, and then like after you build the products, yeah, other another team is supposed to test it. How it works, the yeah, so we we test our own stuff. We don't have a separate team that tests it. Um, so we are all completely self sufficient. So the 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 team is not just software engineers. There are other roles. I didn't talk about some of those, but one of the other roles is an analyst role. We'll call it a business analyst, and you can have a business analyst, a senior, a staff, a principal, right? Kind of similar to what the software roles were. We also have a product owner. And there's a product owner and senior product owner, and da 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 da. Um, so the, the the product owner helps helps uh, take, and the analyst help take the requirements from the business, and the product owner kind of figures out in what order are we going to build it to provide the most value for the business, right? the analyst role analyzes, they are literally analyzing things. So they may look at these different, the, the different systems and they have to come up with, how are we going to solve this particular problem that it works with the business domain? So they're, they're really good at the business side, not necessarily as good as the technical, right? Um, and then everybody else on the team is a, either associate engineer or software or senior. So I have three senior engineers on the team. Um, one software because I just transferred one software engineer and then I have three associates on the team. Yep. They have seven. Yeah. Three, six, seven, and then eight and nine are the PO and the BA. Yep. It varies from team to team. Some teams yep. have mixture, some are all engineers, some like some of the teams that are in my group are combination of quality engineers, product owners, testing, it all depends. Uh, at Rocket, your team owns it, owns, like Keith was saying, from beginning to end, and even the support afterwards. We don't just write software and then throw it over the wall, so to speak. So whatever Keith writes, he's going to own for mm -hmm. the longevity of his career in, on that team. And that, that, that really forces you to make a really good decision up front, right? Because if you're on call for that product, then why would you care what you chose if somebody else has to support it? Like think about that from a psychology standpoint, right? I could choose anything and implement it with any database I wanted or any technology stack, but, and I'm not on call, I don't have to pay for it, right? But if you make a decision, you better have a dang good reason why you wanna pick it, why you wanna use it. You should have done your homework, right? So a lot of times you'll spin around and doing research and development on, uh, on a new tech, tech stack, right? Um, we just we just recently had a big discussion around which database we wanted to use for a particular thing. And it's it's literally draw pros and cons. And we're literally writing everything down, trying to decide because, A, we don't want to screw it up. B, we have to support it. C, it's got to support the business. Four, it's got to work every client, every time, always. Right. So those decisions go into how we build stuff and how we support it. Um, and. Uh, we have certain rules that we stipulate things, but like Joe's team, for example, they, they, they deal with fees, as I said earlier. So fees has man, a massive amount of rules. And so whenever they go in and change rules, they can change the rule, but they still need to do a lot of testing to be sure that it works as expected. And there's no like edge cases and we can get into like edge cases. Well, you just changed the rule. How, how would it not work? It, trust me. There's like edge cases that you get into when you deal with rule engines, which is which is what we uh, use for that. But so there's a lot of testing that has to happen with changing that because you cannot screw up uh, somebody's fee. Again, every client, every time, no exceptions, no excuses. So we don't want to, we don't want to overcharge anybody and we don't want to undercharge because we all like to keep our jobs, right? So we want to get it just right. Um, and so different teams have different requirements based on the technology and they will, they will vary. So there is no secret formula for that. It's, it's, it's up to the leader and the team to figure out what they need to support what they have to support. 
We got five minutes left. Michael just I am me a question. As a software engineer, what is the most common failure in a project? Common failure in a project. Um boy, I could go a lot of ways. Two. I could go a lot of ways with that one. Yeah. Um I mean it. Well, are, well, let me clarify. Are you saying like the software just fails? Like it's just like, can you can you give us a clarification there on that? Are you yeah, out there, like Mike? Anything, yeah, I'm right here. Like anything okay. in general, you know, when you're writing a new software for your company. Okay. Um, what will make it fail? Um, so integration points are hard when you, anytime you have to integrate with other things is it becomes that's your failure point and a lot of a lot of engineers when they're starting out their career they don't understand how to handle failures gracefully right um and and those those every time that you every time somebody sends we call them messages right you're sending a message over the wires typically how we operate um there's all kinds of failure points along the way, right? And so I say this a lot to the engineers on the team. It's not about what happens on the line of code. It's what happens between the lines of code. Now think about that for a moment. What happens between? Because a computer is processing the line of code. And if the network is unplugged and it finished that line of code and the network is unplugged, the next line doesn't run. That's literally how the computer operates. It's running down. So in between this line of code running and before it got to the next line to save it to the database or store it, the network is unplugged. What do you do with the data that you had in memory? What happens to it? How do you, what happens if the computer dies? You know, you're in the cloud. So anything could get wiped away at any point and rebuilt and redeployed. Those are the hard problems. Um, and all of that boils down to a really good solid architecture. That's really what it boils down to. Um, is working with really good architect and working with a really good architecture up, up front, understanding your failure points, right? And then working through, working through the problem as you go. And the other problem that software fails is that developers tend not to have their software talk back to them. What I mean by that is, is that when you take a piece of software and you deploy it out onto a server in the cloud, you don't have any access to it. You can't look at it. You can't get into it. You can't see it, right? And so that software has to constantly be telling you things. And so you've got to have monitoring. You've got to have metrics around that piece of software. And that software needs to be communicating back to the team and those who wrote it to know that it's working, right? It's, 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 it's easy to monitor, hey, is the computer up and running? Is the power on in the data center? Uh, do we have network connectivity? Is the computer responding to things? That's easy, right? What's really hard though is having it tell you when some, whenever it doesn't have traffic. So for example, let's say we don't rock it, we pull credit a lot, right? I mean, we pull credit every second or a few seconds. We're pulling somebody's credit. What if you didn't have a credit pull in 30 seconds? Is that enough to tell you something's wrong? Probably so, because you, you've, you've got this metric over time. But putting those things in and having that talk back to you is something that developers, until they get to that senior architect level, that they just haven't, they haven't gone through the pain and suffering uh, with it long enough yet. And so those are the things that cause it to, um, that cause the team angst. It doesn't necessarily mean the software sucks or it fails. It just, you've got to have monitoring and alerting. It's usually one of those illities that come along late. Now, Joe may have a couple of other things he can throw in there. I think you covered the the big ones. The only other thing maybe to add is uh, misunderstood requirements, which happens every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, have you guys seen the picture uh, where there's like what the client what the client said, what the developer heard? What there's a really famous picture on the on the internet uh, out there, and it's like they're trying to build a swing. This is what the client wanted. This is what the developer heard. The product owner heard this. The analyst heard that, and you get this like crazy con contraption at the end, which is not anything what the client wanted. Um, and that that that's definitely um, that 
the one of the cases out there as well. So good questions. I have some business model questions and not so much technical, um, uh -huh. but maybe you can just quickly go through. So am I understanding it correctly that Rocket Holdings is essentially underwriting all these loans or is what, are they borrowing money just like other underwriters? Well, all of the, all of the mortgages that we, we have, they're, they're all sold onto the bonds and market places. That's just how mortgages, you know, mortgage backed securities. That's how that works. Now we service rocket mortgage servicing. We service 95, 97% of the loans that we close, right? So if you do your mortgage with rocket mortgage, we're going to be your caretaker of that service. We're going to help you. We're going to still, still be there. Right. Um, and so part of it, like we're doing Rocket Mortgage, it's our largest entity in Rocket companies, but we also have Rocket Auto. So you want to buy a car, we can help you out with that. You need a personal loan to take a vacation, we got Rocket Loans, we can help you out with that. And so really, as, as you start to see us build out more of our Rocket companies and what we're really trying to do is just help everybody solve those really complex moments in their life. You know, getting a mortgage is complex, buying a car is complex. Uh, getting any type of loan, even a personal loan, uh, any other things like like that. You can think about, use your imagination for all the things we can loan money for, you know, and how complex some of that stuff is. And we're going to try to just make it so much easier, better. I, I literally have a friend of mine is buying a piece of property of, of mine that I have. And so he's buying it with a home equity line of credit. And he's a veteran. So he went through his, his veteran you know, thing or whatever. Um, and I've been waiting for a month for just to get a simple HELOC. I mean, it really should have been, they just did a drive by appraisal and go, yep, the building's there. He didn't owe any money on the house. He literally owes nothing. He's just trying to pull out some, some uh, money for that. And so it would have been, it would have been much easier if he would have, you know, if we could have just done something else for him, you know, with that. So, but so along but yeah. the lines of making everything more simple, um, did that eliminate the sales department? Well, we still have, we still have bankers. I mean, you know, we have people that, that do stuff. We have some team members. We have, we have loans that nobody talks to anybody. They just go through the system, right? doesn't mean they don't talk to a human ever. You have to still dis disclose certain things. And we have documents and, and that, but people always have questions. It's complex, right? Um, but we still have bankers. Um, we actually have opened up branches so that people can just walk in and see somebody face to face. So we, um, we, we had that a long time ago. And then we just went all call center type of thing. And then uh, some others um, wanted to take that opportunity and kind of go back to that. So we, we have some places that you can just walk in. They're only in, in the Michigan area, I think, or in larger urban areas that there's only a few currently but but they're rocket branches technically um so there will they'll always be you know somebody to to talk to if you need it mortgages are com complex in the terms of like getting a personal loan though you don't need to talk to anybody right i don't talk to anybody if i need to borrow money uh for things that like rocket companies doesn't have you know if i need to go buy a boat there's no place to go yet um for that but I can call my credit union. I don't have to call them. I just go in, click, 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 fill out a loan app. Then I get an email that says you're approved or not approved. And then I send them documents. I don't even talk to anybody, you know? And so those kind of things we want to simplify um, as, we, as we move forward. No. Awesome. I know we're at time, but I really want to thank you, Keith, for the presentation and the advice and, um, all of that. Should anyone have additional questions, would they be able to reach out to you or Joji? Absolutely. Uh, Keith Elder at Rocket Mortgage. I'm throwing it into, uh, into uh, the, the chat there if you have any questions or, or follow-ups. And um, I, I appreciate everybody listening. Oh, hopefully you got some value out of it. And I, I hope it helps you out in your career. And, and uh, if you wind up getting into the software engineering field one day, uh, save my email. I'd love to hear from you in five years when you say I got that senior software engineer role that you talked that you talked about. That'd be that'd be awesome. Awesome. Well, if everyone can just unmute and say thank you to Keith and Joe G, that would be really great. Thank you.
Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Joji. Thank you both. Thanks so much. Not a problem. Thanks, Thanks Joe. Thanks, Thanks Keith. Absolutely. Thank you.